to welcome everybody back to the Independent Investor Channel. If nothing has proven true in owning highly on stock, their ability to surprise to the upside and continue to deliver uh, upon a timeline. Now, that's been just recently delayed with the last Q3 uh, earnings report. That, that was to be expected. Really, the, the impact cannot be ignored. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's fair to say that Hylion Holdings is not the only company that is uh, incurring um, some of the problems with uh, some of the uh, chip delays uh, that go into uh, the products that is going to ultimately uh, delay their ability. I, I think this is going to be a test for them to circumvent this. Um, this will not be the first uh, 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 hurdle that they'll have to overcome in the history of the company. Unfortunately, they're having to do it so close to the inception of the company. If there is any silver lining that exists with Hylion Holdings, is that I don't think Hylion is prepared to accept mass order anyway. And, and I think they can continue along their uh, product validation stage, really solidify their customer relationships and, build, and continue to deliver on other catalysts, established other uh, forms of relationships going into 2022, which this video is aimed at exploiting where I think based on the track record uh, that Hylion has been able to uh, surprise to the upside that I believe that that's going to continue. And I think that it's just going to continue to build the pressure behind the dam um, with the company itself uh, in what I feel is still a very disconnected uh, stock price from the action with the company. Um, this company is still brand new. And even though it is pre-revenue, these uh, strategic pieces that Hylion is putting into place on multiple fronts will continue to build that pressure uh, until these catalysts are put forward in the marketplace to be uh, not ignored anymore. I think for those folks out there that uh, benefit from my Hylion videos, a um, couple reasons why I put these out so frequently. I, I wish I didn't have to do this. Um, I'm, I'm dissatisfied with the amount of transparency that Hylion uh, provides to shareholders. Um, I wish that Thomas Healy would share a little bit more in my sentiment. And, and who am I? Uh, but I, I frequently have guests on the channel, CEOs, CIOs, CFOs, uh, many, many times over. And I can't tell you how many times the, the driving shareholder value is echoed as a, a paramount uh, responsibility of the leadership in a company and specifically on the CEO itself. So if I was going to give a, a critical um, um, recommendation to Hylion, it would be to mention driving shareholder value much, much more than they currently do. And I think with regard to the transparency on really telling the Hylion story, um, I, I think Hylion at this point, and I, I don't mean to be rude, uh, but this is business. Um, they get an F. I, I don't think they do a good job at all in sharing the right stuff. They share stuff. I just don't think it's the right stuff. And it doesn't have to be a professional production. It does not have to be uh, you know, anything outside of just a, a, an iPhone that we all carry around pushed up to Twitter and those feeds that are good and conducive for that type of material. That's all it, it takes, you know, put an onboard uh, driving uh, video or a vlog uh, that that right there is going to churn some information for people. I don't care uh, about the professional nature of the videos. As a matter of fact, some of the professional videos, you can tell that they were made months prior to the release online. And I think a lot more real-time uh, type of uh, uh, transparency on progress being made at the company uh, would actually truly tell the story, the one that I think is going on, which is why there's a lot of reason why I put out my content the way that I do, um, because I just don't, outside of a few other channels out there like Paul and Ronnie and Henry um, and a few others that are telling the highly on story that the, the best that they can um, I, I don't think Hylion gets uh, a, 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 even close to its due attention for the opportunity and the pressure that I speak of that's building behind the dam. And there's many, many things that I'm going to talk about. And this is not just my opinion. This is based on track record. So if you disagree, please leave that disagreement down in the comments section, because I don't want to make this seem like because I am a known advocate for and bull of and large shareholder 
in highly on holdings that somehow I have the inability to provide a, a, a perspective from both sides of the story. Um, I just told you one of my bearish thesis. Um, do I think that's a reason to have the stock uh, months in the basement? No, I don't. Do I think that uh, Hylion is in, is um, intending to uh, to do that? No, I don't. I, I give them a pass. And, and my uh, opportunity through the Independent Investor Channel to share the Hylion story from my perspective only speaks to what I presume is going on behind the scenes, and that is progress toward Hylion's goal of changing the world and, and building a company that has staying power. And I do believe that a lot of these initiatives that they talk about through product validation are aimed at just that. But a, a bone every now and then to provide some level of acknowledgement that driving shareholder value as the number one priority, like number one, you're a publicly traded company. It is your number one responsibility. If you don't like that responsibility, go private. You are now a publicly traded company and driving shareholder value should not be anything other than the number one priority, not priority seven, not priority 672. It needs to be priority number one. And I don't know if executives or management or anybody else that follows the highly on story or is in, you know, in highly on, I don't get replied to on Twitter. Um, I've stopped engaging with investor relations because, again, my grade of their performance is, is terrible. Um, they, get a, they get a one out of 10, um, and that's, that's terrible. There's room for improvement. I'm being constructively critical, and I, I might be overly unfair uh, to their defense because there has been more presence put through um, with the YouTube channel and with the Twitter, Twitter presence, but there needs to be more, and it needs to be the right stuff. OK, and I think just coming up with these ideas off the top of someone's head might not be the way to go. Perhaps maybe they need to get somebody in there that really understands marketing and how to tell this story correctly, because I think right now it's a complete hot mess. And I don't believe that they're telling the story again. If I didn't have to come out every three days with a new highly on video and tell my perspective on what I think is the real play with Hylion, um, I, I, I would be a shareholder if I had to do this or not. It would not matter. My bullish thesis does not change. This is not meant to misconstrue or, or tell a story about Hylion that is, that is um, untrue. The, the idea here is to provide clarity on what I feel is the real talk on this opportunity in Hylion meeting its long-term goals. So let's get into this, guys. I've done up a list here uh, of 10 uh, catalysts, 10 elements that I think over the coming 12 months, Hylion will, uh, will achieve. And this will be the very checklist that I work from. So get a pen and a, pa a paper. Um, if anybody with Hylion is listening, get a pen and a paper. You can learn a little bit from this as well, because your track record of providing incentive to the market has been phenomenal. Unfortunately, the driving shareholder value has been nil. It has been non-existent. Um, the, the stock market does not believe what you're putting down, okay? So the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over and over and over again and expecting different results. I, I think you really need to look into that philosophy. And again, this isn't meant to be rude. This is meant to be constructively critical. And with a stock price that's off uh, uh, close to 70% year over year, I, I would put this in the bucket of insanity and a well overdue bucket of insanity that you've been in here for, for months and months and months. And failing to acknowledge that reality um, is really, really drawing on uh, retail investors' um, uh, sentiment with the company. In other words, you've pulverized uh, investor sentiment at this point without even throwing a bone their way. And I think the disconnect between that transparency with the company and shareholders like myself and thousands of others who come to my channel for a little bit of real talk, a little bit of perspective, and a little bit of forward thinking and perspective and acknowledgement of where we are in the current, current uh, situation with Hylion. Uh, specific, not only with the company, but the disconnect between the company and the stock price. Number one, 
Hylion will secure more orders. Okay, they will. And you've got companies out there, if you listened correctly, um, Amazon was mentioned on the call. Anybody pick that up? FedEx was mentioned on the call. Scary how interesting uh, 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 the relationship is with Sherry Baker, the uh, CFO, and Pepsi. All right. The interesting uh, relationship that Warren Buffett may have to tie into this whole thing. And talk about this a little bit into the future. Interesting how uh, Elaine Chow has the ties with Kroger, the number two grocer in the United States of America. Now, are any of those going to be secured? I don't know. But here's the thing. I base my thesis and my presumption based on historical ability to garner orders. Monet was a perfect example of that. 40 orders with a fleet of 48 uh, trucks. What that means to me is a relatively small fleet has the conviction enough to pledge their loyalty with a company like Hylion and put in an order of 40 trucks, probably realize a couple of those orders once the binding happens. And I think I've explained this many, many times, these reservations will be the benchmark uh, by which binding orders are weighed against going forward. In other words, in year one, if Monet takes delivery of, let's say, two trucks, okay, one or two trucks, depending on what the OEM hubs can, uh, can, uh, can assist with, on um, a little bit more volume production. I don't know what that's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be one or two, or if they're going to be able to utilize the, the order book for Monet to get them more than one or two trucks on the onset. And then that uh, binding order will be based against their reservation book. In other words, it'll go down to 38 at that point. The following year, if it's three to five trucks, it'll go down respectively. Uh, in respect to those binding orders against the res reservation playbook. Now, remember the reservation playbook is enormously widespread. Okay, Detmar uh, is a fairly small company as well. It is a private company, interesting enough. It just speaks to me that the uh, diversity uh, across the reservation book ranges from some of these smaller companies to some of these larger companies like Ag Agility, of course, with their 1,000, A&G, uh, as well as Detmar with their 300. Um, but, but what's going to end up happening is as we start to solidify that reservation book going forward, and, and does, is there anybody out there that thinks that that's not going to continue to happen? This has been a consistent theme over the last 18 months with Hylion being able to secure this reservation order book. And if you guys think that that's somehow going to stop, I think that takes more imagination than my presumption that the order book will continue to grow out with reservation placeholders. And what this means for these reservation placeholders is it is building a queue, an order queue that is going to be used to prioritize um, who takes first delivery on the first available trucks that come off of the OEM hubs when that product validation is complete. This is going to be huge. And this is going to be the, 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 the multi-layered um, approach and strategy to getting into the four-year rotation of these fleets. Thomas Healy talked about this. So the first order out of the gate, just imagine we're going to have multiple initial orders stepping into a potential relationship long-term with these companies that are going to look to either maintain, scale up, or yes, do away with. They could take their first order delivery to trucks and not like it, okay? But here's the thing, with the amount of product validation that Hylion right now is standing up and saying, this is absolutely the best way to do it. We have to, before we scale up to mass scale, go through this product validation and we need to make sure that we can win customers based on the product that we put forward as the best drivetrain solution on the market, okay? So this is absolutely key. If we're going to win customers, you have to win them the right way. What it is for the right way is not just to get a, a 40 reservation, deliver two, and they're unhappy with the product because proper validation has not been uh, completed, and they have problems with the truck that could have been foresaw during the product validation stage, okay? doesn't make any sense. I would rather see that order come through under two. 
Monet come forward on their earnings report and say the bottom line savings because of our Hylion solutions that we put into our fleet renders this to the bottom line, X and X to the bottom line. Our truck drivers love it, and it's helped improve and drive our efficiency, and we get to fly the flag of a company that is stepping in the right direction uh, for the green initiative and for the, um, uh, the protection of the planet and the environment and carbon emissions, et cetera, right? That is a, a customer that is going to step in the following year and say, you know what? We want to increase our truck uh, fleet size to five. We're going to continue to roll on our old trucks or we're going to rotate out a couple of our older trucks with the envision of replacing our entire fleet or a good percentage of our fleet with the new Hypertruck ERX, okay? So Amazon, FedEx, I think Kroger's gonna be a player in this deal. And I, I, I actually believe that there's gonna be some order, orders that come in from companies that surprise to the upside that there's no way at the time of filming this video that I could forecast. I'm very, very good at predicting based on past events, what we can anticipate happening into the future, but if they are educated guests at this point, but imagine what an, an order from Amazon of 500 ERX trucks would do uh, for the stock. Are, are you telling me that that's not a catalyst or a, 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 um, an icing on the cake or a, a one last pressure behind the dam that could potentially break the dam on this thing? You're crazy if you'd suggest otherwise. And I think this continued uh, order book win streak um, is going to continue into the future for Hylion. And I think it's going to only continue to build that pressure behind the dam. Second, Hylion will continue to expand the team. The team ex has expanded up to 150. And in all fairness, man, that's a pretty small company, if you ask me. You have to build this team to strategically um, offer uh, their expertise to the whole. And I think 150 is relatively light what they're um, anticipating doing over the long term. And I think Hylion will also continue to expand their facility. How do I get this idea? Well, if you listened closely to the earnings call, they uh, increased their team from just shy of 100 up to around 150 employees. So that is the track record. The trajectory is on an upswing. Why does it make any sense at all that somehow the progress will not be made toward building out the team, continuing to build out the management team, and continuing to uh, improve upon the advisory team? right, with the board of directors. The, Hylion has proven uh, no such, uh, up, uh, anything other than an upward trajectory on this front. So it, it, it would be ill-advised for me to not speculate uh, in, in a certain capacity that that trajectory will continue north. And I have no reason to believe that that won't happen. The facility, they've leased the building right behind the headquarters. That's basically doubled the space. It looks like that facility is going to be continued uh, space for R&D, uh, battery uh, uh, production uh, in that space, and continued expansion for uh, employees going forward. So here, just taking the right steps in expanding and really looking to build out that framework and, and really the, the baseline of the pyramid right now uh, for a company that is going to look drastically different in five Five years. I mean, th this company is going to look back on this time frame and it's going to laugh. It's going to be like, man, you remember when we leased that building um, where th they may just have multiple sites, both here in the U.S. and abroad that they're working from to push their solution out um, into the mass scale production line. OK, number three, they will recognize revenue. OK, this is going to be a big catalyst. I can remember not too long ago when Tesla, that was their big catalyst when they recognized revenue for the first time. The discussion up until then, every single analyst out there had a sell rating on the stock. Every single one of those analysts have really had to eat pro where from a fundamental perspective, they may have been right, uh, but ultimately they were proven wrong. And that's the humble nature of the stock market. And I think all too often analysts are put in a corner where they're having to put forward a report on a company that they've pledged uh, their coverage to. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these folks have to derive their opinion based on the short and maybe even the medium term. And I, I think that's really unfortunate. I think it's really a, a tough position to be in on having to speculate on a company that doesn't have a lot of predictable 
metrics to go on, it's got to be almost close to uh, an impossible task. And this is why um, I'm an advocate for coming on saying these guys are just dead wrong. They're just dead wrong because there's no way that they are in the know in such a capacity to put forward a, a downgrade unless there are motives behind it. And there are. And if you don't have folks like me coming up with a thesis, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. You could say, and I, I get crap all the time. It's like, well, you don't like what they have to say. Therefore, you're down on them. No, that's not true. If you look at the increase in position by both of the companies that they represent, they come out with the hit job and then they accumulate more shares. Okay. My money is with the big boys. Okay. I don't follow these analysts and say, oh my goodness, the stock's going to five. I'm going to sell and wait till Hylion hits $5 on the nose. I'm not going to do that. Of course not. I have my own conviction on the company. I believe that these 10 catalysts that I'm going to talk about in this video will transpire over time. I absolutely believe with 100% conviction that they will. Will the stock maintain its current stock price in the gutter? I don't know. I don't know. But again, it's a step in the right direction and providing that ample pressure for eventually that dam to break. And I think recognizing revenue, you don't think that that's going to be bullish. And if you don't believe that they're going to recognize revenue, the 359 that showed up in uh, accounts receivable, 359,000 was about a 300% increase on the 89,000, uh, about a 325, if my math is correct increase from the 89,000 on the books. These hybrid units, man, they're selling, okay? And they're being sent out the door and they're being billed as appropriate. You can't recognize that as revenue. But coming into February, 2022, if your bet is that Hylian is not gonna surprise to the upside, that's fair based on a track record to say, look, Ryan, they haven't recognized revenue as of yet. But is that really a criteria for you to look at the stock and either say invest or not invest? Be fair. If you make it up in your mind as being one of those uh, criteria and pillars for your investment thesis, so be it. That's the beauty of independent investing is that you get to come up with your own investment thesis. That thesis could lead you uh, along the right path to profitability, or it could be ill, Ill founded. A and you could find that eventually this company does actually turn out revenue. And it just so happens to be the predictable catalyst that allows some level of, uh, of, of, of anticipated revenues of bottom line earnings that are going to come in with the company. And that way we can start to evaluate and, and start to do some uh, price to earnings projections going forward. Right now, it's impossible. You can't do it. It's an educated guess. That's why at this point, I don't really understand you know, analysts coming out and every month they've got a new opinion because they're pulling out whatever hair they have left because this company it can't provide the metrics necessary to provide those accurate um, assessments. And I chalk them up as a hit job. That's my opinion. I'm entitled to my opinion. I'm allowed to give my opinion and have free speech and will on what I see and the timing of said downgrades based on publicly uh, available information on said downgrades, okay? These companies are sitting back fat and happy on their few hundred thousand shares. I think last check, Goldman Sachs is up over 650,000 shares have owned uh, in, in the company. If they weren't so bullish and they thought that it was going to the pink sheets, do you think they would own a position at all? Ask yourself those rhetorical questions, okay? Got to read between the lines. You got to be somewhat creative when you own a company like this. And I do believe that they're going to recognize revenues, whether or not it's on our next milestone, February, 2022. I'm not holding my breath. I don't really care if it happens, it happens. If, it, if the stock pops 25%, I could care less. My stock position does not change. My disposition with my position does not change at all because my long-term thesis is still intact. Number four, <clears throat> the OEM hubs. This is something that I need to hear more granularity around on the Q2 earnings call. Uh, Thomas Healy was asked about this. What is going to be um, the cost um, of the components that go in and the cost associated with um, the OEM agreement and these hubs that are going to assist with mass production and scale up. Sherry Baker uh, really just kind of alluded to this a little bit in response to one of the analysts call on the Q3 call, uh, talking about the margins um, and the relationships with the vendors driving, uh, increasing those margins by driving down the price um, with uh, the new relationships with the vendors uh, that, that they're solidifying. And, and that will continue to solidify 
uh, over time, because I can only imagine the component order book uh, that goes into these uh, highly on products that they're turning out. Those relationships only stand to improve over time. But I think the relationship with the OEM hubs is going to be something that I'm, I focus on. This is going to be the, the, their path to profitability and mass scale up. I, uh, profitability will come uh, as a means to an end, but the, really the ability to mass scale up and use those OEMs um, to, to, um, uh, to fill out those uh, binding orders that they uh, get against their reservation order book is going to be key. And if over the next 12 months we hear nothing on this front, then that will remain an open checklist item. But it makes my list of 10. That has to happen. I believe that it will happen. And I believe based on the, us, us winning one uh, of those OEMs right now, I believe we're in bed with Peter Bilt. I, I think what, what a fantastic opportunity with those folks. OEMs are not going to stand by and allow Peter Bilt to turn out massive amounts of this product to big, big Fortune 500 companies without getting on board. And I, I've talked about this before. I think the demand from the customer to the OEM is really going to be the sell. Okay. Hylion's not going to need to sell OEMs, but I haven't got a lot of granularity around what existing relationships with the OEMs exist as of yet. Uh, to allow those relationships and those chassis to go to the OEM hubs right off of the main OEM line uh, for the specific install of the Hylion product, whether it be the Hypertruck ERX or a new install off the line of the hybrid product, whether it be an, an existing new truck rollout on the diesel side or the CNG side. Okay, uh, so the OEM hubs. Number five is the government relationships. And you guys remember Andrew Card is start, uh, still part of the program here, you know, um, the old uh, Department of um, Transportation Secretary, uh, Elaine Chow on the board of directors with these direct uh, connections to, uh, uh, to Washington, D.C., um, the, uh, um, fuel, the, um, um, uh, the fuel credits um, that have been put forward on the Hypertruck ERX with the 75 of pure electric miles that can be run in our big cities. I'm thinking about Los Angeles and New York specifically. These products, they, they are um, ready to go, okay? Just need a little bit of product validation, but I think some incentive from the government is a catalyst that could be enormous. This could be one singular catalyst uh, amongst many that could break the pressure behind the dam. Relationships with governments and incentives, okay? A lot of Tesla's income comes from government incentive. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think that the, that the two versions of the car that they have, or the ones at least that we see all the time on the road, is, is driving the sales. That's just not true, okay? And, and I think to have that much support from the government, in other words, if you took that support away from Tesla, what would it look like? What exactly would it look like? And a lot of people are saying that Hylion doesn't need that. But you're telling me that an incentive to a company like Monet to provide some level of green incentives to say, hey, we're willing to step in the right direction and the power of Hylion to go to the government and say, look, man, we've got 1,590 reservations. If you can just provide some level of incentive, 25%, 50%, uh, dare I say 100%, of an incentive from the government to step into this, to allow for that payback over time to, to, to happen. So these new technologies can put, be put in place on the onset and, and, and really ramp up what has been conveyed as an emergency for the planet, right? It, it's been conveyed, whether or not I believe that or not is, 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 is irrelevant. But if the government really it, 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 um, insists upon uh, initiating these green initiatives and doing so now then provide set initiatives for these fleets who are standing by ready to rock. Okay. That is a big one. Okay. Number five, over the next 12 months, if there's no government intervention, this will again, remain an open action item on my uh, path uh, roadmap for Hylion over the next 12 months. But uh, the government incentive is a big one. Uh, number six is to product validate. 
if we, if we don't hear any type of uh, product validation and certification, Thomas Healy talked about this on the Q3 earnings call, uh, the EP, EPA certification and other certifying entities, um, this is the only co company that I've heard talk about this. Um, evidently, Hyzon has the ability and Nikola um, to just uh, jam products through without going through any type of validation at all, zero. Uh, Nikola Bulls will disagree with me, but I, I, I just don't see it. And I do, from a surface level, cover both of those companies for interest sake. Say, so what is Hyzon doing different than Nikola? Well, what they're doing is they're jamming product to marketplace. And it looks really, really good for Nikola to come out and say, by the end of 2021, we're going to deliver 25 trucks. Okay, the market takes that vague information. And I think this is where Hylion is much more transparent with the real talk, okay, in you know, supply chain shortages, um, delays in delivery of trucks until 2023. I, I, th I think they're being truthful with this. And, and I'm not sure if uh, Nikola is conveniently uh, not being so forthcoming. A and then when they get to that point, they just delay the order and they've already benefited from the good news that's been put out through uh, the market. The market looks at it and says, wow, Nickel is killing it, 25 trucks. They don't even uh, look below the surface and say, and say, where are those trucks going? Have there been validation? What are the specs on the truck? What can the truck do? I had to go onto Hyzon's website and their specs are a 500 mile range. So comparatively speaking, it does not even hold a candle to Hylion. And nobody's, nobody's talking about these cross comparisons. I'd like to see these cross comparisons come up with the evolution of the technology weekly. I think it could be a very, very simple graph that they put on to Twitter. And Hylion is the one that goes on the offensive and starts to, starts to say, no, this is the product specs as declared on the investor slide deck from Hyzon and Nikola. And here's what Hylion can do to in, in a cross comparison. And let, let investors look at that information. Okay. That's key. And they failed to do so thus far. We've moved away from what type of fuel savings uh, are provided through the uh, EX1 improved model. Okay. I haven't heard one single thing on the 30% fuel savings that that's supposed to render for fleets. 30% is enormous. And is it, is it a pipe dream? Is it, was it a concept? Is it something that is actually being realized in fleets now? We don't know. Driving shareholder value, that is key, all right? So validating the product over the next 12 months continues to be a theme that Thomas Healy foot stomps all the way through each and every one of these uh, uh, order books and, excuse me, the, the uh, conference calls, uh, their earnings calls, and how important a role these larger fleets play uh, in that product validation uh, um, uh, phase that they're in right now. Uh, number seven is to break the short interest. This is huge. This is just another pressure that's keeping the dam intact. The short interest still resides at 20%. Short sellers will continue to short the stock until they have been provided a reason not to short the stock. Right now, they've been provided no reason not to short the stock. Mm -hmm. This is business, okay? Short sellers have been right on the money with this company. And Hylion, which is interesting, if Thomas Healy's a race car driver, he should be portraying a little bit more of a competitive spirit in, in combating some of the short seller articles. I, I can presume any more that any of the articles out there, especially ones like Investor Place, are not impartial. If you read the description of what their goal and motive is, it's an opinionated article. And those opinions, I believe, I presume, have motive. And I could be wrong, but I believe that they do, okay? Because one opinion comes out and it's completely on one side of the fence. Another opinion from the same Investor Place comes out and they give an opinion on the bull case. For, for Hylion. That doesn't tell the story. It just does not tell the granular story of what's going on. And, and that's all it is. It's, it's an opinion and a hit piece. But to break the short interest, it's going to be any one of these catalysts that are going to break the short interest and put a squeeze on to where the shorts are going to have to cover shares. I think a key that's being missed in all that is the longs that have uh, well-established uh, well positions in Hylion they won't sell. They won't sell. And I think that very fact is being underestimated in the marketplace. I don't think large institutions will sell. And I actually don't think that retail investors will sell based on this conditioning 
of retail investors that we've been there and done that before. If you're able to hold this stock in the seven to $8 range, you're most definitely going to hold this stock in the 12 to $15 range. Now, I do think that there's probably some folks that invest on emotion and will sell out of the stock because they're just pissed off at the company and they've lost all conviction in said company. I do believe that. Okay. I hope I'm wrong. Um, I will not be in that camp. Uh, I will be in the long-term holder camp. I will be a, a lot more comfortable in knowing that we've established a base and started on an upswing at, in the $12 to $15 range than the range that we're at right now, um, You know, which could break below the 675 support. I don't see that happening. If it does, it doesn't matter. I, I, again, my day-to-day -day conviction has nothing to do with my long-term thesis on the company, okay? So stay, stay long. Stay strong. If you're going to make an educated decision on this company, don't make that educated decision, which is, is ill-founded day-to-day. Make the educated decision on what you presume to be the company stock price in two, three, four, five years plus, okay? That is the only way that you're going to give yourself a fighting chance in this company. Now, in five years, if this company is still $7 a share or $8 a share, fair enough. I will eat crow. We will make an educated decision together. No problem. But in the interim, it's futile and it's irrelevant. It's futile and it's irrelevant. Earnings, government contracts, 20% pops in the stock should not play into your long-term conviction at all. And I do contend and I give away the goods by saying this. If you want to own the company, just hold it long. It's very, very simple. It's the most simple strategy you can follow. And if you truly buy into that conviction move in the company to just hold the shares, no matter what, then the day-to-day -day does in fact dissolve to irrelevant. Okay. It really does. Okay. So break the short interest. Over the next 12 months, we'll still be uh, monitoring the 20% short uh, 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 share float, and we're looking to break free from that, um, have the tr uh, stock uh, trade a little bit more outside of a, a kind of a manipulated type of fashion. <laughs> the stock gets bought right as soon as the market closes. You see the stock pop you know, a few percent, and then those shell shares are sold right back on the market. The, the, the company dumps every day, and then it fights its way back. They do that so not to garner SEC uh, scrutiny over their short selling tactics, okay? Because they don't have any interest in the company at all. They don't. They would like to see the company go as low as physically possible so they can continue to make money, okay? That is the game. And unfortunately for short sellers, I think in 10 years, this is going to be such a predictable game that there's going to be a lot of retail investors that make a ton of money uh, off of that predictability because it is going to be less uh, manipulatable into the future because it is so predictably manipulatable, okay? And retail investors like myself will call that BS all day and will profit from it, okay? We'll just wait it out uh, until they get done bending the stock over and, and raping it because again, they have no interest in the stock. We'll just call that BS and know that eventually that stuff will work itself out. They'll be forced to uh, short cover and then it'll be off to the races, okay? The next, number eight. This might catch some of you guys um, uh, off topic a little bit, but I actually think an X factor for Hylion will be to land a whale. Mm -hmm. Yep, we bagged the elephant, right? Um, is it so much uh, of a far-fetched type of thing to think that Warren Buffett steps in in some capacity? Now, remember Warren Buffett, I believe, owns a large position in Kroger. The connection to this is you don't think that he would accept or Berkshire wouldn't accept a call from uh, the board of directors, and you know exactly who I'm talking to, uh, talking about, okay? A lot of these board of directors own chairs in other boards, okay? Now, if, if Hylion starts to turn out some predictable revenue and Munger and Buffett take a look at this, like any savvy investors, I, I think it would be far not far-fetched to, to think that maybe they would take a small position in the company based on their bullish thesis around the A&G network, okay, and the bullishness around renewable natural gas. Now, Buffett and Munger would have to buy into this as a fuel, okay? for the future. 
and they would have to understand and, and look at the metrics that exist between the RNG cost to diesel equivalent in comparison and really just make a bullish call on that. You want to know what that would do if Buffett takes a position in Hylion directly under Berkshire Hathaway? I'll leave that rhetorical question to you. Now, if this thesis does not play out over the next 12 months, no problem. No problem. I think institutional buyers will continue to increase, which I think that there has been uh, some, um, um, you know, a degree of increased of, uh, of financial uh, institutions interest in the company. Okay. And I think that will continue. Well, how do I, how do I know that? It's based on the amount of uh, institutions that currently own Hylion Holdings and have added those to their ETFs, okay? They're part of the Russell. They're part of the, uh, the S&P. And they'll continue to be added uh, as appropriate going forward. And I think institutions, as this stock continues to build that pressure behind the dam, they will start to accumulate more shares here um, as the stock has just proven time and time again to have ample support at about the 7 to $7.50 range. Again, in the short term, it could dip, okay? It doesn't mean anything. Large institutions, do you think they invest on emotion? Of course not. Of course not. So when they see those opportunities, it might be a nice ample opportunity to add a mill, uh, 2 million shares more to their, to their existing uh, positions, maybe even lower that cost basis any more. Uh, more. And, and so the, the cost of value proposition over the long term, entering into a company like this with, with as much upside potential as there is at $7, very, very attractive. And right now it's giving an open door to buy the stock at these levels. But I think landing a whale might be one of those catalysts. And mark my word, I'm the only one who's offered this. Um, it doesn't have a potential to not transpire. Of course not. But this is, this is a discussion. I mean, of course. You know, this could just mean that it's an open action item, but to have a big ticket whale to kind of step in and even somebody who steps in and takes a seat on the board at, from more of an advisory role um, could be absolutely huge for Hylion and really be that catalyst, right? And uh, and really give them that direction that they need and provide that, that uh, incentive and, and pressure behind the dam that I talk about. <clears throat> Number nine, Sherry Baker talked about this on the Q3 earnings, and that's Penetrate Europe. She knows it exists. We've got to get the product validation done here from now until that product validation and the beginning of securing some binding orders on the order book. That, that's going to be the, the real uh, telling time is when Hylion plays the Europe card and moves abroad. I think that that was something in a staunch difference between Hyzon and Hylion is that Hyzon already has international exposure. And, and quite frankly, me, I disagree with Hylion on this. I think they should go international. I think they should start the product validation right now. I think they should go for it. I think they should go for it right now. Um, I, I can't disagree with the path that they're taking in getting the validation here in our backyard. I, I understand and I have to support it. It doesn't mean that I have to disagree with more of what I perceive to be more of a blase type of approach to, hey, we're going we're gonna to validate a product over and over again that we were supposed to be product validating for the previous 24 months, right? So I, I don't understand why we have to continue to validate, validate, validate when it seems like to me the perception, at least the stock market's perception of these companies is that Nikola and Hyzon are eating Hylion's lunch. And they're doing so because Hylion seemingly is taking this high road of product validation with no real guarantee that uh, uh, companies are going to step on board because of the validation. I think companies are ready to step on board right now. And I think they're ready to evolve with these company uh, with Hylion uh, it, 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 side by side. Instead of Hylion taking on all the risk of product validation and perfecting a product and really laying a red carpet in front of these companies to take delivery of these trucks, I think there needs to be some shared risk. And that's where I go back to the potential for government incentives to share a little bit in some of these risks. Because what I'm seeing here with a $1.5 billion company, they're, they're going to have to incur massive, massive costs 
to get where they inevitably need to go. Now, remember, there is a, um, a, a share offering um, capital raise in Hylion's future at some point, and make no mistake, that is going to happen. But I think it needs to happen when there is clear, clear guidance going forward um, that there's uh, wide acceptance of the product from multiple fleets out there, that there can be some level of anticipated uh, um, letters of um, intent uh, to purchase products going forward. Okay. Um, timing on that uh, share offering and raise of capital is going to be key. That's been on the books ever since um, the original submissions to the SEC. And uh, they know not to do it now. The stock would uh, plunder to two bucks and they, they know not to do it. But I think where it be um, well-timed into the future, that's really going to be one of those catalysts to the upside uh, if they well position the capital raise, okay? The last thing I will say is to deliver they the continue to deliver on catalysts, okay? Some of the catalysts that have allowed the stock to pop a little bit and find a little bit of favor in the marketplace has been the eight minutes of charging um, on their battery uh, system that they have, their proprietary battery system. That's key. Um, the 70 mile, uh, miles of BEV and uh, uh, applying for uh, the ZEV credits uh, in both California and New York that are uh, kind of the leaders in the, in the forefront of the industry, Hylion is well-positioned to kind of play that card. Um, the ability to provide us a little bit more granularity on being the fuel agnostic ERX, I feel is another catalyst that we know that eventually Hylion can profit from the hydrogen fuel cell initiative and how everybody is so bullish on that product. I think some of that uh, bullishness is ill-founded with the lack of infrastructure in place and the cost to produce and the cost to offer. Uh, Hyzon does a really good job of glazing over this, but the fact of the matter is the cost in the marketplace is not convo conducive to the transition to that right now. It's not. And I think the bet there is that the cost to produce the hydrogen will come down over time that the infrastructure grants and the multi, multi billions of dollars that need to be put to that initiative will be provided government supplement because that's what it's going to take to provide and build out the infrastructure to that. A catalyst to that end will be highly on stepping forward and saying, hey, we, we can actually uh, play in this space as well as well as our existing fleets that we put out um, uh, that are looking to burn RNG through the existing net network through uh, ANG. So those multiple catalysts, these are all catalysts that are real. These have all happened over the last 12 months. And I think the idea behind putting out this video is to provide some level of forecast going forward on what I feel are going to be the 10 elements or roadmaps or catalysts, call it what you will, that could really continue to build the pressure behind the dam. It's going to happen when you least expect it. And it could be any one of or all of the aforementioned catalysts that I mentioned in this video to keep a, a perspective on this. The short term means nothing. The medium term means nothing. Will all of these happen? Will none of these happen? It will be the very framework that I judge and say, look, we've met this catalyst. I can check it off the list. Some of them will be continual catalysts. Some of them will be those that we revise and evolve with Hylion over time, as for example, the order book turns out. We've heard nothing on a whale stepping into helping the Hylion. We've heard nothing from the government potential for incentive. And if we start to get a little bit of discussion on these particular fronts, it's only going to help the fire smolder a little more in providing that eventual uh, pressure behind the dam that I feel like eventually is going to break that dam and really unlock that value that we all know is there, but we're just waiting uh, for those catalysts to uh, align with the company uh, and the stock action as of now. Guys, I appreciate you tuning in to the highly on videos. I would invite you, please leave your comments, man. We don't get anywhere without open dialogue and commentary around this because right now that's all we have with the lack of information coming from Hylion, I'm looking to generate and manufacture that dialogue outside of an expectation of Hylion to continually feed information because of nothing, what they've proven over the last 12 months 
is that they are incapable of doing such things. So let's manufacture it on our own. If you enjoy the content, make sure and subscribe to the channel, share the message with anybody out there that you know is interested in the company, owns stock in the company, is a bull or bear on the company, would love to have them on. It's an open invite to come on and discuss this once in a lifetime opportunity in stepping into the EV space, specifically with electrifying powertrains on existing existing trucks with major OEMs going forward. And I think the next 12 months is going to be absolutely critical in meeting some of these catalysts that I talked about in this video. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future.